Hey guys, um, we're going to do our first virtual lecture. Um, I'm going to try the video. Look, I made like a nice little like Spartan backdrop. So you need your chapter 22-23 reading guide. That's this. And we're going to go through. Um, we still have to keep videos under 15 minutes per YouTube regulation, so this might have to be in multiple parts. So I'm going to start a timer. All right, so let's first talk about some economic stuff. Um, you've learned about supply and demand type stuff in economics and econ. So let's first talk about market price. So you're looking at, I don't like that. I need to have the headphones for the microphone so this sounds better. But we're looking at um, just kind of like the normal price that you would pay for a good or a service, um, a product. So we're not including any indirect pricing, any hidden costs, no environmental concerns, no human health, anything like that. Okay. So this is where I would ask you to like turn and talk to your neighbor. We don't have neighbors right now, right? So um, the direct costs of making a car. So we're talking about raw materials, labor, shipping, markup for dealer profit, gas, maintenance, insurance, repairs. Those are all things you probably could have brainstormed. When you're talking about indirect costs, maybe you're not taking into account like the aluminum that had to be mined and then the ore separated and then smelting and making the chassis, the frame, that kind of thing. So you're looking at um, <clears throat> the environmental and human impact, kind of. And so if we include those, the environmental and human effects, that's what full cost pricing is. This is number two. And so it asks what benefit is it to determine market values with full cost pricing? We can improve the quality of the environment. So that's how you should answer number two. You talked about subsidies with me before. You guys are relatively knowledgeable about subsidies. Um, it's money given by the government to support an industry. And kind of our classic subsidized industries are our fishing and our mining and our forestry and transportation and big oil. We're going to call those perverse subsidies. I know it's, a, it's an interesting choice for a vocab word. So those are the ones that classically aren't good for the environment, need to be phased out. And we're talking about, um, again, those kind of typical industries that we just learned about in the previous two weeks when we were actually face to face. And so the idea kind of is to shift, right, to shift the subsidized money to environmentally friendly, don't want to put the cursor there, to environmentally friendly processes like pollution prevention and renewable energy. Maybe we shift a big oil subsidy to a hydroelectric subsidy. Our problem, what makes it tough to get rid of them, are lobbying groups. So you have these interest groups that are paid by these big industry organizations that lobby our politicians to vote, and that's why it's hard to shift these subsidies. Okay, so that was number three. Um, so now let's talk about green taxes. So one of the suggestions kind of is to shift away from income taxes and even sales tax to green taxes. And so these would be taxes on a business or an industry based on like how much they pollute or how much fertilizer they use, how much hazardous waste they're using. Okay, so it's not necessarily on us as individuals, but we would be paying more for these things that are paying for their green taxes, if that makes sense. And so when you're looking at green taxes, um, it's difficult to successfully implement, okay? So I'm gonna give you an example of a country that's done it, but it's not super easy. So in order for it to be successful, you're looking at a decade or two, 10 to 20 years, minimum of planning in order to be successful. Um, like I mentioned, you don't, you don't want a net increase in tax. It's a zero net increase. You're shifting. So you're shifting away from income tax and you're taxing these big industries. And then as a consumer, you're paying extra for it. And then we also need to set up a safety net for the poor. Okay. So Costa Rica has done it successfully. They have increased their tax um, on fossil fuels. Um, they've been doing it since 1997, which is a really long time because that's when we graduated from high school, me and my husband. So the tax revenue goes with this national forest fund, which is also kind of cool. And they set up this fund for paying indigenous communities to help protect forests around them and reverse deforestation. So Costa Rica is definitely moving in the right direction with this. Okay, so that's number four. Number five is about eco-labeling. Okay, eco-labeling 
here, put it all on here for you. Puts it in the hands of the consumers. There you go. Eco labeling puts it in the hands of the consumer. So we're labeling products to basically show us how the manufacturer conforms and recognizes. <coughs> no, I want to use the pen. There you go. No, not the highlighter. Um, to show these environmental standards. So I'm going to put some examples up here for you, I think. Yeah. So it's hard to write. So a rating scale, sustainable fish, sustainable timber. Oh, that says sustainable fish or timber. That's kind of janky. I don't like that at all, but that's okay. All right, so those should be your examples for number five. Greenwashing is an attempt by an industry or a product to make you think that it's eco-friendly based on some keywords and some advertising. So if you look at that poster on the right-hand side of the slide, it's about clean coal. We're using colors like blue and green, which look like the earth and like it looks really friendly. And it talks about um, this clean coal and how much better it is for the environment. Okay, And it's a stimulus package. Like we, They wanted the government to vote on it. So this was a campaign in 2008. The coal industry spent $45 million on it. In reality, coal is coal. Coal is the dirtiest burning fossil fuel. It released the most CO2. And regardless of type of coal, this happens to be anthracite, which we learn about next unit. Is anthracite cleaner than bituminous coal? Yes. We learned about that. It's going to burn hotter. It's going to release slightly less CO2. But coal is still coal. There is no clean coal. Natural gas and petroleum are still better options with renewable energy even being better. So greenwashing is that deceptive pro process to trick consumers. Uh, there we go. All right, now we're kind of moving into chapter 23, which is urbanization. Um, so you should be on this page now. I'm talking about number seven, urbanization. So we're looking at growth and creation of urban and of suburban areas, okay, of urban and of suburban areas. We live in a suburb. 52% of the world lives in urban areas. So you're looking at percent, ooh, how do I get it back to a cursor? There we go. Percent of people in the country or world living in such areas. Like that's how they measure how urban an area is. And when you look at urban growth, you're just looking at a rate, the rate of increase of urban population, either by births, or by immigration, as you can imagine. So when you're looking at trends of urban growth, this is number eight. Um, is this number eight? No, eight is on the next slide. Sorry about that. But you're looking at, in general, people are pushed from rural to urban because they're seeking something out, or they're pulled out to rural areas because something's not being given to them in urban areas, okay? So now look at number eight. Looking at trends. <clears throat> trends um, globally in terms of populations. So number one, the proportion of people living in cities is increasing in general. Proportion of people living in urban areas is increasing as the population grows. Part of the reason is because the number of urban areas in general is also increasing. It says mushrooming, so growing at an exponential rate. Um, we've got things called megacities which are 10 million or more people. We've got hyper cities, which are 20 million or more people. Um, Tokyo is our biggest city in the world. It's 37 million people. Tokyo has um, more people than the entire country of Canada in one city, which is unbelievable to think about. Another trend we're seeing is that the urban growth is slower in developed countries. Um, we don't have the land. We don't necessarily, we're not growing as fast, but it's the developing countries that are becoming more urbanized. And those developing countries are often perverse, right? Like there's, there's, they're low socioeconomic status. So poverty is becoming urbanized in less developed countries. So if you look at some pictures here, see, it's so much more fun to do this in person because I'd have you guess what these cities are. So this is Shanghai in China. This one right here is Phoenix. 
It's a very good example of what suburbs look like, like these houses kind of in rows, just like Brookfield. And then the bottom is this rural area of Malawi, Africa. And when you look at mega cities, which are the 10 million or more, every dot on this map shows you one mega city. So look how many we have in the US. Notice most of them are around the coasts, which connects back to like our water pollution type stuff. But that's really interesting. So if you're looking at trends in growth in the US starting at 1800 and then ending in 2008, we have our own trends. So trend number one, this is the answer number nine, we migrate from rural areas to large central cities. In 2012, almost three quarters, 71% of Americans were living in these cities. Number two, the next shift, migrating from large central cities to suburbs. A lot of us did this. I grew up in Milwaukee. I live in Brookfield. That's exactly what I did. I went to the suburbs. And then you see kind of the shift from the northeast of the country to the south and the west. Look at Las Vegas urban growth. On the left is 1973. On the right is 2009. Like the interesting thing is like, look at all the green. But those are kind of just people's yards. A lot of it is AstroTurf. <laughs> so the green's a little bit deceiving, but you can see the growth of the city. So in general, as people move out, it's called urban sprawl. Urban sprawl is that low density, so that spread out development on the edges of cities and towns. I guarantee that your yard is bigger than any yard in the city of Milwaukee. So that's low density housing, when you have a decent amount of land and just one family. High density housing are apartment buildings, houses that are close together. Okay, so that's urban sprawl, which is number 10. Um, not a great thing. Here's the table. Here's the table. There you go. Um, I want you to list five undesirable effects. So we're losing land as urban sprawl occurs. And there's the cool Madison video that I was going to show you that you can kind of look at on your own. But pick five of these to write down for number 11. I wrote down increased runoff. I wrote down unemployment in the actual city, like some economic effects. Unemployment in central cities and de-emphasis of downtowns. Fragmentation of habitat. And you lose your tax base as people move off. Okay. So we talk about two different types of cities. Well, I got three minutes. Here we go. Um, compact versus dispersed. Okay. Compact versus dispersed. So compact cities, we don't really do in the U.S. They grow up. <clears throat> this is Hong Kong. Um, <clears throat> mass transit. We have lots of um, subways and whatnot, and then it's easy to walk. In the U.S., we grow out. Can you guess what city this is? It is Milwaukee. Yeah. So when you look at reducing automobile use, which you have a lot in the spread out cities, here are some options. Um, <clears throat> this is number 13. We can increase price of gas so that it's full cost pricing. We can raise parking fees. You can change the tax shift. So you, you decrease income tax to increase gas prices is another Remember, We're not making new taxes. In Chicago and Illinois, we know they have tolls on roads. Um, in Singapore, you have cars with electronic sensors that charge you every time you go into a major city. Car sharing, short-term car rental. In Shanghai, it costs $9,000 for a license plate. That's a deterrent for using your car for sure. So this kind of just shows LA and how crazy the roads are and how crazy the traffic is. And so we're talking about reducing cars. We've got to offer some options. So here's our options. Biking, like in Portland, Madison has some great bike trails in Portland. 8% of bikers commute to work. 8% of workers bike. I said that wrong. 8% of workers bike. They have all these miles of bikeways. Minneapolis is kind of famous as well. You can look at subways and like the L in Chicago, that's heavy rail. Streetcars and trolleys, that's light rail. Buses, and then think of like bullet trains um, in Europe and Asia. There's lots of talk about doing one in the US, but so far, no go. So if you're looking at preserving open space, um, you can have an urban growth boundary where the cities stop. This is Portland. This is a municipal park. I'm sorry, this is a municipal park. That's Toronto. This is an urban growth boundary. You can. This is like Central Park. This is Toronto's um, green belt right here. That's Central Park. And then finally, what would an eco city allow somebody to do? Um, you would be able to choose walking or biking, reuse and recycle, that kind of thing. So I know I kind of rushed at the end. I really, really wanted to keep the video within our allotted time. Um, have a good week.